Let us remember our marhumin and recite the Surah Fatiha in their memory. Al Fatiha. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللائن الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي حدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا حدانا الله والحمد لله الذي جعلني من أمتي سيد المرسلين قاتم النبيين طا وياسين Ahmad Mahmoud Abu Al-Qasim Muhammad Wa min al-muhibbin aitrat al-tahirin La natu al-daimi min al-an ila yawm al-deen Ala adaihim amma abad Kala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Fi kitabihi al-majid Wa furkanihi al-hamid Wa kawluhu al-haq بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم سلوات The ayah that I began with talks about the concept of change and what Allah can do and what a human can be, being can do when it comes to the process of change. Before I delve into this, the walk today was an inspiring experience. To walk with like-minded people, men and women, and to feel the energy and the vibrancy of walking for Abba Abdullah, the short distance that we had from where we started and where we ended. I have not been able to participate in the Najaf to Karbala walk, but if this energy is anything to understand, I cannot imagine what that energy would be when we walk from Najaf to Karbala. This is the miracle and this is the lasting legacy of change that Abu Abdullah, Imam Hussain al Islam inspires us. No other community, no other faith, no other group has the energy and the potential to make a difference, to make a change in the world that we live. And if we fall short, then we will be asked on the Day of Judgment to say, but you had say, what did you do? What did you do to make this world a better place? What did you do? That Imam Hussein sacrificed so much. What did you sacrifice? And may Allah give us the tawfiq to raise the generations who will continue in this legacy. The idea of organizing these walks to imbibe the spirit is something that we don't know. The rewards, the rewards is, is, is with Allah. But the impact of it is that we continue to maintain a tradition. A tradition as to why 17 million people gather on Chehlum to visit and pay respects to Imam Hussain and Islam. And we join that procession from Edmonton. If we cannot go there today, we join that walk. Salawat. So, Mumineen, this is the sixth in the series, having looked at the intentional living, critical thinking, how best we can use our time. What is our value proposition and value as human beings? And then we looked at how we live a purposeful life. Today, we look at change because life is a journey. 
And by definition, a journey means movement. It's not being stagnant. It's not being in one place. It means that we are moving. And as long as we keep moving, then there is life. And when we say we keep moving, the best thing when you move is that as you're walking, you're looking at new surroundings, different surroundings. And in that journey of life, we are constantly learning. And if we really stop learning, then we die. If we continue to learn, we are alive. And therefore tonight, we're looking at the idea of that journey as to where we came from. I apologize for that short graphic, but I was told by IT that put your graphics on one side so we can display your, your video on the other side. So uh, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm saying that picture Makkah at the time of the Blessed Prophet. As the strong thrived on exploiting the weak. Women did not have rights at that time. Girls were buried alive. And success was measured through the number of camels that you owned. And look at today. The 1.6 billion Ummah. The change that has happened has happened because of this one single message of La ilaha illallah. This is the legacy of saying there is no God but Allah. I have accepted His authority and therefore it will be in His obedience. It will be for His pleasure that I will live my life and I will make a dent and effect on the society based on what pleases him and not anyone else. This indeed is a liberating message of La ilaha illallah and this was what the Blessed Prophet was able to do. Yesterday I talked about Hazrat Bilal as to how he achieved freedom from slavery. Despite the fact that he was still technically owned by those masters and they were beating him up and he could shout back to say, Ahad, I only obey that authority and not this mortal authority that I have. This is the liberation. If Hazrat Bilal could be liberated from that, we do not have those impediments. What level of liberation should we have from the trappings of modern life, from the trappings of all the stresses that we have? This indeed is a liberating message. Well, today, as we think about tilting that balance of values, where the value became taqwa and not how many camels you had, that was a transformation. It was not a mere change. A few days ago, I invited my young friends to go and look at Mullah Google and see what, what Mullah Google is telling you between change and transformation. I hope that some of you may have looked at it. How many did? Thank you. So. Um, if I make a mistake, then you are going to correct me about change and transformation, right? Sure. So, transformation of the society in Arabia is what we are going to be talk, talking about. But before I do that, I just want to talk about how change happens. Alvin Toffler was a futurist and he wrote several books, several futurist books. 30 years ago, I read a book where he said the power shift. He explained in his book as to how society changed when power shifted from tilling land and from the feudal lords to machines. Therefore, whoever owned machines, the industrial society would be creating wealth. So power shifted from the feudal lords and the farmers and people who own land to people who own machines. And he predicted 30, 40 years ago, I read the book 30 years ago and maybe the book was 10 years old by that time. He said whoever possesses information is going to be creating wealth. Nobody could understand what Toffler was talking about at that time. Today, 
when we look at the biggest corporations in the world like Google and others they are actually purveyors of information and what is in what is their commodity those of you who do coding and programming know that it's just binary code of zero one zero one zero one zero one and you can create billions and millions and the power actually shifted so much so that today Facebook and Google and others can actually manipulate opinion they can manipulate elections if they wanted to or their tools can be used to manipulate the change in all these societies Momini, that is a society that we are living in and therefore our challenges are also equally great when it comes to number one preserving the message of Islam within us and then passing it over in this day and age where information has become wealth people sell Islamophobia articles for money not because of ideology contrary to what sometimes we think is all to do with money how much money am I making for us this is an uphill task to try and put forth a message but we feel very confident that given the Talim, given the guidance of the Ahlul Bayt Salam, we can conquer these messages. But before we can do that, Mumineen, we need to imbibe those very teachings in our lives so that they go through by way of action where our colleagues see us, where people who live in the same town see us as people who are empathetic, as people who are caring, as people who, are in, who have integrity, as people who are genuine human beings out there to serve. If we are able to do that, if we raise a progeny who is going to be able to do that for us, then inshallah we have a chance to mitigate propaganda that comes across and all the persecution that we face in the world. So, change or transform, you looked it up, there is a big difference. That graphic there represents transformation the best way that you can understand. A transformation, and I have a point when I am talking about transformation, that a butterfly that emerges from a larva and from a cocoon is not a better caterpillar, but it becomes a butterfly. It completely transforms into what it was. Meaning there is no going back into becoming a caterpillar. A transformation is permanent. A change is something that you may go back to it. A change may be temporary. In most cases it is. So what we are looking for and looking at is how does Karbala transform us? Which means I am not the person that I am today because if I am transforming, I am not going back after the 12 days being here to back to my old habits and doing whatever I, I am doing or at the end of Chalum that I have had some level of transformation where I am not going to go back to whatever else that I was doing which perhaps I should not have been doing. This is the meaning of transformation that you do not go back. Change actually fixes the past. Transformation creates a future. So change may be that you may change for a few days to say I'll fix my past. But transformation is that a butterfly emerges from the caterpillars that we may have been. I'm sorry I'm not calling anybody caterpillars. It's merely a metaphor so please don't take ill that I call people caterpillars here. Change mode is the desire to improve the past directs what we do. Therefore the past sets boundaries and constraints. Well, I was in this particular box and I need to change, so I'm going to adjust the box that I'm in. Transformation is that I'm looking at the vision, I'm looking at the future and saying, where should I be? My strategy is to be there, to be a better human being, to be a more caring human being, to be a true Husseini as close as I can get to, to the spirit of Abba Abdullah. This is what I am looking at. So the future is going to determine where I am going to go. 
in the ayah that I recited in the beginning translated means that Allah and it's an off quoted ayah to say Allah does not change the condition of a people unless they make that change within themselves the idea of that translation of the word change from Arabic there are some who have used different words but the most common translation is change so I'm still using the word change because I don't take any editorial license with the translation of the Quran because I'm not qualified to do that but change is what happens to us either by force or by circumstances some external force and I need to change I came from Texas from 100 degree heat my mind had to be adjusted and I was forced to change and say no it's not all that cold here if we had that level of temperature in uh, in Houston there probably would be as big a calamity as the hurricane that we had the idea is change is something that's forced by circumstances from outside transformation on the other hand is you have the will to change your circumstances you have the will to say I can do better than this you have the will to say with Sile Raham I am now going to make sure that I do not break or if I have broken God forbid I will repair my relationship with my relatives with my friends with my co-workers whatever it may be because this is the idea of Sile Raham it's done by passion and by a willing attitude change keeps evolving one day you may think it's, it's like almost like fashion you know one day you have a certain fashion it changes and you change and then you come back and change again transformation is something that is permanent that once you are transformed there is no question of going back but staying where you are and moving forward so that is the difference the ability to transform has been given to us through our nafs he then inspired the nafs to understand what is right and wrong for it <coughs> please recite a salawat <coughs> what is right and what is wrong is what our inner being tells us I talked about the concept of nafs al a few days ago it is that conscious within oneself to ask questions and to judge what is right and what is wrong and when akal your intellect is in balance and it is not being pulled by your power of anger or your power of desire then you'll be able to make a balanced decision if any one of those powers are taking priority over your nafs then you move into the direction of going lower than that of the animals this is nafs amara which is taking you there if your nafs al-lawama does not give you a strong enough signal then your journey would be in the negative towards nafs al but if your nafs al is strong enough and you will think about transformation then the least you can get to is the journey where we say this is nafs al this is the contented soul at least that is the level that we need to reach the Aymali Muslim reached the level of nafs razia and nafs marziyah where they were pleased with Allah and Allah was pleased with them those are far stations but the least we can do is reach nafs mutma'inna and transformation also means a change of heart you know this word heart has been used in so many different contexts it's a fascinating organ that we've been given the concept of a heart so I'll spend a few minutes to uh, just look at you know what does it mean because the Blessed Prophet said and I quote that surely in the body there's a small piece of flesh if it is good 
the whole body is good. If it is corrupted, then the whole body is corrupted and that is surely the heart. These are the words of the Blessed Prophet. So what did he mean and what does it mean to us? Well, we have three ayah of the Surah Al-Shu'ara where we are told that disgrace me not on the day when they are raised, the day on which property will not avail or sons, except him who comes to Allah with a heart free from evil, which is the concept of Qalb Salim. The idea of Qalb Salim, and when we talk about change and transformation, and looking at what the Blessed Prophet has said, let's try and analyze. Let's try and analyze. And once again, this ayah was revealed and Allah was speaking to his Khalil Nabi Ibrahim to say on the day of judgment, the whole of mankind will be in a loss, except according to that ayah, someone who brings to Allah a sound heart, qalb salim So this is one key to our transformation. So let us look at the words of Ayma alayhi salam when they talk about qalb salim because now we are on a path to transformation. And I crave your attention just for a few minutes to absorb this because Imam says, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, qalb salim is that heart which meets Allah in a state where it has only Allah in it and none else. So I have a choice. <clears throat> Either this heart is a throne of Allah or the award of shaitan. Choice is mine. But Imam says that when you go to Allah with qalb salim then you have none but Allah. This is again pure Tawheed. The whole idea of the school of Ahlul Bayt is so steeped in Tawheed, all roads, all discussions lead to the idea of Qurbatan in Allah, the idea of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not accepting anybody else's authority whatsoever. So let's do some heart to heart talking here, right? You know, they, you use the words, you know, somebody steals heart, somebody wins hearts, somebody breaks somebody's heart. Somebody learns something by heart. You have your heart in your mouth to your heart's content. But how much do we really know about the heart and how it works? This is also contemplation. The marvel of that organ that the Prophet talked about, and this is not an anatomy or a physiology class, but at the risk of saying that this is not, let me share a few things so that we remember and those who have studied this will remember, it will be a refresher. Those who haven't will probably learn a little bit new that it beats a hundred thousand times a day. This little pump, look at the blessings of Allah. And when I said this a few days ago that Mawla Ali said that obey Allah to the degree that you need him. Only that much, no more, he said. So now for every breath, a hundred thousand, that we take, for every breath we take, we need that kuwa given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what should our level of obedience to Him be? A hundred thousand times a day, at least if not more. This is 35 million times in a year, and in an average lifetime, the human heart will beat more than 2.5 billion times this pump subhanallah this is the blessing that we have in under a minute your heart pumps blood to every cell of your body and they say that over a course of a day about a hundred thousand heartbeats shuttle about two thousand gallons of blood in your body this is the pump that how hard does it work imagine that if you give tennis ball a hard squeeze, you're using about the same force that, that is being used by your heart to pump blood into your body. Imagine squeezing a tennis ball so many times in a day. That is how precious your heart is. 
and you need to look after it. All those fatty foods are the biggest enemies of your heart, amongst other things. But I'm not going into that. Also, subhanallah, the heart, they say, is created before the brain. And it actually starts to pulse from its first day till death. So it is the first organ that actually has life in it. And till death. And the heart is beyond just a pump. And there's so much research. When I was reading it, I was just fascinated that when, do, when you do heart transplants, the heart also has memory cells and those memory cells get transplanted in the feelings that people have towards the kin of the people that the heart has been transplanted actually remain. This is again the wonder and when we look at this that the heart is not just a pump, there is so much more to it. I invite you to really look at this blessed organ that we are given. We take our bodies for granted, Mominin. If we have a car, we are going to service it every day or every month. We are going to look after it. You can change the car anytime. You can lease it, release it, change it, buy another one. Brothers and sisters, this is the only body that we have got. Let us look after it. By way of reducing our stresses, making sure that the diet that we have fits the body, and that we take care through exercise and all that. I'm sorry I cannot get off the sort of soapbox here, but I feel very strongly that sometimes our community does not pay enough attention to our health. It's only when we get sick that we start becoming sort of reborn. You know, the, the Christians have the fish sign to say this is a reborn Christian. We actually be, uh, become re, reborn health fanatics and we do everything. But when we are healthy, we take it for granted. Apologies for the sort of distraction here, but I do feel that we need to take care. And this is the message of Muhammad Sayyid al-Islam, that as we take care of the rest of the world, we should also take care of our own bodies. Salawat. So the root word where the term qalb comes from means to rotate or to turn. So the only thing that it pivots around when it's qalb as salim is a creator and it connects a human being in the seen with the unseen augmented by your intellect. It's a connection between the mind and the heart. Sometimes, you know, we say, well, my heart tells me to do something mind tells me to do something. There is that always a conversation happening between the mind and the heart that the rational, the logic to say if I give away money uh, to try and fund something, well, my bank balance will reduce, but the heart is telling you that this is such a great cause, Allah will give you so much more. It now depends whether the mind will take over or the heart will take over. Sometimes you need to have the mind taking over because emotionally you may take decisions. But in most cases follow your heart because that is your fitra and that is something that Allah has provided us with. So the, the idea is that there are four kinds of hearts. Imam Muhammad Bakr al-Islam has said that there are four kinds of hearts. And let's just analyze, just take a few moments inshallah you know, I will end on time. I know it is Sunday night. We all got to go back to work, to go back to school and all that. So very quickly, Imam has said the heart that has both faith and hypocrisy in it. That's one kind of a heart. So you, you believe. But at the same time, you, there is hypocrisy. Then he said there is a heart which is inverted and upside down. Then he says there is a heart that has been sealed and is darkened. And then there is the heart that is clear and luminous, it's Al-Azhar. It's a clear heart. So what do we mean? So the first one is one which has got both hypocrisy and faith in it, is a diseased heart. It's neither fully healthy nor completely dead, but it does have signs of hardness in it, at least emotional hardness, if not physical hardness. As it keeps committing more and more sins without repenting, the dark spots on that heart will increase till they cover the whole heart and it becomes a dark heart. So imagine, and we talked about this previously too, about Molana Rooms Bramble Bush. You know, a small sin is not a small sin. 
each time if it puts a dot on your heart which is a nice clear heart time will come that it may cover it and your heart will not be able to be luminous so this is a heart which has got both you see it's equivocal i'm good sometimes i'm not so good other times and this is what we need to do and then imam says there is the inverted heart which perceives things inverted it sees the world imam says is more important than the hereafter this is an inverted heart it's a heart which is upside down where imam ali al-islam said and i quote again to say earn for this dunya for the length of time you're going to live in this dunya and earn for akhira for the time that you're going to live in the hereafter so what does our common sense tell us tell us in terms of how much time should we spend or invest in in earning the dunya as compared to earning the hereafter i leave that judgment to you it craves and strives more for this world then worry and prepare about the hereafter and then he says the inverted heart is also one of a hypocrite believer who outwardly claims to accept the truth but inwardly denies it for the petty gains of one's life and then then is also the heart of a fasik who follows some of the commandments leaving of others to fulfill his heart's desires i follow some i'll pray namaz but you know fasting is too long i can't do it so it's fine you know i will now make my decisions as to what to do well the sharia is sharia it comes as a package you cannot pick and choose as to what i will do and what i will not do may allah you know accept everyone's efforts we are not here to judge we only make a statement as to what the imam ali wasallam have said and then there is the third kind of heart which is sealed and darkened a heart that has rejected the truth after it has reached it when you understand you come to the truth and yet you reject it is incapable of benefiting from the remembrance of allah in accepting the call towards his message this is a heart that is a closed heart when truth has reached you and we have a responsibility of at least ensuring that the truth reaches whoever is supposed to get it because we too will be asked on the day of judgment that there were people living in a certain part of the world they never received the message of islam is it their fault or is it your fault that we gave you the message you did not transmit it so and finally you have the clear and the luminous heart a heart that is one of a pious believer the light that radiates from the light of faith shines through as a righteous actions of the body so it emanates from the heart which is awake which is enlightened and your actions will be reflected by what you feel inside and that is why the heart is so very important it is a heart that is likeness of a lamp the heart that is clear and luminous who is thankful when allah gives him and patient when that heart is subjected to tribulation we looked at hazrat ayub yesterday and for 70 years he was given abundance and it was all taken away from him as a test and he did not complain he said should i not be thankful that i got this for 70 years and therefore should i not be bearing this state for another 70 years this is the meaning so hadith al qudsi tells us that the heavens and the earth cannot contain me but the heart of a mu'min holds me so if this becomes the throne of allah not an abode of shaitan then that is the journey mu'minin towards qalb salim and that is why it's so important to understand this so if you don't change your inner world as this aya says your heart and mind nothing will change or transform in the outer world therefore the key is the first key to transformation is that i must feel it in my heart that i would like to transform all of us can be better human beings than what we are nobody can 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 say that i am a perfect human being all of us at a work in progress every one of us and this is something that if we have a patient you know changing your job moving to another city getting new friends 
And if there are any plastic surgeons here, forgive me, but getting plastic surgery or more money, etc., will not heal you or make you whole unless you're healed from within first. So how does that happen? Conversation within oneself. We're talking about a positive internal dialogue because looking at the rose tree, if you see the rose and not its thorns, that's a dialogue within, while a pessimist actually stares at the thorns, oblivious of the rose. The idea is to count one's blessings that we have and not be negative is the first process. That you check your blessings. This is the first step towards the transformation the Blessed Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. That whosoever is not thankful with a little will not be thankful with a lot. So what we need is inner peace and that life journey to conclude almost is the journey from Nafsi Ammara, the animalistic soul where my powers of anger and desire take me to go be lower than that of the animals with the help of Nafsi Lawama, I can make the journey to go on to so that I can have that inner peace and have that itminan so that when I present myself to my maker on the day of judgment, I go to him, insha'Allah, with Qalb Salim. Salawat. So, let's begin with just a little bit of heart detox, shall we? Heart detox. What is heart detox? Man comes to Imam Jafar as Sadiq and he said, you know, I am your Shia. And Imam says, never, these are his words, my friend, never claim to be one of our Shias, lest Allah on the day of judgment raises you as a liar. These are strong words from the Imam. Man comes and says, I'm your Shia. And he knew better. So he tells this to the man. And then he clarifies. And this is our heart detox. Imam says that no one can be our Shia except a person whose heart is free of deceit, malice or hatred towards others and free of corruption. That is a detox that we need from the words of Imam al -Islam. And then he says, if you are not such a person, you can claim to be our admirer, but you cannot claim to be our Shia. These are the words of Imam Sadiq al Islam. Salawat. So, Mumineen, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us that tawfiq to take some time off and reflect and do some self reflection and say, how far am I in terms of reaching that level of qalb e salim with the potential that we have, each one of us. And this is where the nafs mutmainna comes through. In Karbala, on the night of Ashur, the Kalbe Salims that were present there were praying with great joy and happiness. They say that it was like the buzzing of the bees. We remember that by some of the rituals that we do. The buzzing of the bees that was coming through from the tents. These were hearts which were hearts at rest. These were hearts which were hearts that had reached the level of Kalb e Salim. Amongst them, amongst them was a young man, the son of Imam Hassan al Islam, Janabe Qasim. He was on this eve of Ashur when there were conversations taking place, and Imam was talking about the day to come. The young man asked his uncle and said, Oh uncle, will I also be killed? And Imam embraced him and said, 
Oh my child, how do you find death? And he said, Mumineen, the answer that Janabi Kasim gives, he says, I find death sweeter than honey. This was the state of the companions of Imam Hussein Islam. When Janab Qasim readies himself for battle on the day of Ashur, and he goes to Imam Islam for his final farewell, Imam took Qasim to his bosom and both wept for a while, perhaps remembering the days and maybe Imam Hussein, remembering Imam Hassan at that time that, oh, my brother Hassan, if you were here today, you would have been one of the best, biggest helpers for me. Janabe Qasim advances into battle and the Maktal literature reports that he went to out to recite and said, I am the son of Husa, the son of Hassan. If you are unaware, the grandson of the messenger, the chosen, the trusted. Who might be Muslim, one of the reporters at Karbala actually writes, and I quote him, to say that a young boy came out of the tents of Al Hussein and approached the battlefield. His face was like the first splinter of the new moon. He had a sword in his hand and was wearing a long shirt. As Qasim bin Hassan was fighting with the soldiers that surrounded him, Mumineen, it was Amr who sneaks behind him and strikes him on the head with a sword. Janabe Qasim's head splits open and falls to the ground from his mount and he said, Oh uncle, oh uncle, come to my aid. Imam was standing there watching his nephew. No sooner had Qasim cried out to him than Imam, descending like an eagle upon his prey, launched an attack, tearing through the ranks of the enemy. Momini in their horses collided and Amr fell. The horses galloped over the body and he was trampled to death by their hooves. When they finally managed to carry it away, as a cloud of dust and sand raised by the galloping horses settled, Imam was seen standing by Janab Qasim. The Imam put his cheek on the torn chest of Qasim, crying and lamenting, saying, O oh child, O oh child, it is unbearable that you called out your old uncle, and I could not come to your help, and when I did, he was to no avail. Momin in final words, to say, Imam takes Kame Qasim's body into his arms and carried him. Mominin Qasim was not such a tall person, and he had Qasim's feet were dragging to the ground where the bodies where the bodies were being carried. Mominin, the body had been mutilated so that the I cannot I cannot really imagine to recite as to what Imam Hussein al Islam was feeling as he carried the this body. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajun mu'minin. Kuch alfaz yad karane ke liye. E janab e Qasim ko bedar karte hai imam. E ghoda ya Qasim ne sawar hona chaha. To ghoda thoda sa uncha tha. Abbas al-Islam ne bar ke ghod me liya. Qasim ko ghode pe bitaya. Rakabo pe pe dale. Sun sako ke mu'minin. कि रब का वो तक पैर भी न पहुंचे चश्मे काट कर रकाबे छोटी की गई अरे रकाबों में पैर डाले हाथ में घोड़े की लजाम ली और एक छोटी तलवार लेके मैदान के जंग की तरफ चले अरे कैसे चले कुर्ता पहने जिसका गरेबान खुला चमकता सीना सामने मैदान में आकर हैदरी आवाज से पुकारा कि मैं हूँ हसन का फर्जंद दुश्मन का लश्कर भी कहने लगा कि करबला के मैदान में कासिम आए या फिर सिफीन के मैदान में अली आए अलगरज मोमिनीन बस आपकी सहमत तमाम देव बेटा हैदरी जलाल में हमले के लिए बड़ा तलवार चमकी सर पर पड़ी सर के दो टुकड़े हुए जमीन पर कासिम से संभाला न गया ऐसी जमीन पर गिरे
जब जमीन पर गिरे तो आवाज दी के चचा चचा आइए कातिल ने चाह कि दूसरी मरतबा काशिम पर तलवार लगाए हुसैन घोड़े पे सवार ललकारते हुए बड़े अरे कातिल था जब मैं आता हूँ और इतना तेज हुसैन आए कि मेरे साथ जजी को हटने न दिया बस मोबनी आकाशिम काशिम मैदान जंग में पड़े हैं अरे काशिम तड़प तड़प कर पुकार रहे हैं अरे ओ चचा अरे ओ चचा जब गुब्बारे जंग बैठा तो लोगों ने देखा कि काशिम जिंदा है मगर टुकड़े टुकड़े एरिया रगड़ रहे हैं और उसे झुके हुए ये कह रहे हैं कि बेटा चचा तुझसे शर्मिंदा है तेरी मदद कर सका इन्ना लाही व इन्ना इलाही राजू मातम हुसैन